Welcome back. I'm Steve Brunton, and this is a new lecture series on sparsity and compression. Uh, this is chapter three from our new book, Data-Driven Science and Engineering. So many of you have seen in spy movies, uh, James Bond, Jason Bourne, some satellite photograph taken from you know, miles up of a credit card or a license plate that is blurry, but through some kind of magic software, they're able to refine uh, kind of the letters and the information to, to get you know, a legible uh, credit card number or license plate. Don't worry, this is just my Japanese Metro card. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to go you know, into the mathematics of how you would take low fidelity signals and try to pull out as much information as possible to kind of refine or get super resolution uh, images. That's one application. Uh, or to you know, maybe someone is trying to disguise themselves with a fake mustache and, and big glasses. Can we subtract those off of their face and figure out what's underneath that image? So that's all kind of applications that we're going to be able to explore uh, in this context of sparsity and compression, and so much more. We're going to use this for modeling complex systems, reduced order modeling, uh, robustifying our dimensionality reduction and machine learning algorithms. Uh, it's the basis of, of all of, of image compression, which we saw a little bit uh, in the last chapter on the, the fast Fourier transform. Okay, so I'm really excited. This is gonna be uh, one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite chapters of the book. It's one of my favorite topics in general, and there's a lot of really, really exciting new research coming out in this, this area of sparsity uh, and compression and compressed sensing. Uh, every week there's new and interesting results, okay? So we've already seen uh, kind of this diagram of how compression in general works, image compression. So you start with a high resolution image, uh, in this case of this jellyfish, and in uh, some transformed basis, in this case in the fast Fourier transform or wavelet basis, one of those bases, then most of the Fourier coefficients are very, very small. This is actually plotted in a log plot, so, so most of these are almost zero. And you can truncate and throw away the vast majority of those, of those entries, maybe 95%, 99%, or even more can be thrown away or truncated. So you only keep very few uh, Fourier coefficients that are actually contributing to the information in this image. And then when you inverse Fourier transform, you recover a very high fidelity representation of your original image. Okay, so this is kind of the, the starting point for this new lecture series on sparsity and compression is where we left off uh, with the Fourier transform and wavelet transforms, okay? And I just wanna point out kind of almost definitionally what do we mean by sparse? So up here, this image of the jellyfish is what I'm going to call dense because you need all of those pixels. If you threw away 95% of these uh, jellyfish pixels, it wouldn't look like much. Okay, but in this representation, after we transform it through this unitary Fourier transform into a new coordinate system, now what we have is a sparse representation of our original data. And actually, it's, it's especially sparse down here once I've manually thrown away the 95% smallest Fourier coefficients. And so really what I mean down here is uh, sparse, what that kind of means is mostly zero entries. Okay, so that's what I mean by sparse. It's a, it's a vector or an array or you know, generally a tensor, whatever. It's, it's a mathematical object, usually a vector or an array that mostly contains zero entries. That's what we mean by sparse, is that you can throw away most of the information and there's only a few entries that are non-zero. In this case, these kind of uh, core Fourier frequencies in the middle that you need uh, to reconstruct the image. So that's the idea of compression. We've already talked a lot about this with respect to the Fourier transform, wavelet transform. But now we're gonna turn this whole paradigm up on its end and start asking more fundamental questions. Why are signals so compressible? So that's, that's maybe the first and most fundamental is why um, are signals so compressible? Okay, uh, and this is actually one of my favorite uh, kind of areas of applied math is really digging into uh, kind of why signals have so much structure. Why is it that you know even though I collected a million pixels here, I only need 5% of that information in this representation? That's a, a really interesting and fundamental question uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna answer. Another one is, if I, if I know that 
I'm going to collect this million pixels just to throw away 95 or 99% of them after compression, did I need to collect all of those measurements in the first place? So that's really a, a huge question. Can we measure less? This is a really, really interesting question. Can I get away with measuring you know, five or 10% of those pixels, maybe at random, and can I infer what these sparse Fourier coefficients, these active Fourier coefficients have to be to be consistent with those measurements? Can I downsample and still reconstruct my high resolution image? Now, if you asked this question 20 years ago, the answer would be no, you can't. But advances in applied math in the last few decades have made this possible. So there's a huge field called compressed sensing. Compressed sensing. And this promises to revolutionize how we collect data and how we do signal processing in some applications. Okay, so this could, uh, this could change data acquisition. Acquisition, it's always dangerous spelling live. Data acquisition, okay? So compressed sensing is super interesting. Can we get away with measuring less? Do we have to measure all of these million pixels if we know we're gonna throw away most of them anyway? We're going to talk about some fundamental mathematical concepts like the L1 and the L2 norm. So we're going to explore uh, kind of the math and the norms, uh, the math of norms. And in particular, we're going to look at the L1 and L2 norms, okay? so. Uh, you're used to the L2 norm, which is uh, kind of given by these circles of equal radius in the L2 norm. Uh, but the L1 norm, you have looking like diamonds, okay? So kind of points of equal radius in the L1 norm look like diamonds uh, versus the circles you're used to, okay? And it turns out that this L1 norm is really, really important in finding solutions that are sparse, in promoting sparsity. So we're gonna look at the L1 norm and why it is so useful for kind of compressed sensing and ensuring sparsity in signals, okay? Uh, and one of the things that I really love about this field is that it is extremely practical. What you can do once you understand sparsity and compression and kind of the geometry of these high dimensional uh, vectors and objects and signals is that you can develop robust algorithms. So you can have um, kind of your favorite algorithms from before. So uh, all of the algorithms you know and love, you can robustify them to outliers or corrupt data or missing data, all kinds of things. You can robustify your favorite algorithms, again, using sparsity and the L1 norm and things we're going to talk about in this lecture series. Uh, so neural networks, that's a big one. Uh, the singular value decomposition and PCA. So we're going to robustify the principal components analysis. That's a huge one. Uh, reduced order models, what we're going to call ROMs, reduced order models uh, of physical systems. We're going to use sparsity to get interpretable models uh, for physical systems. And we can also use this for sensor placement. Uh, so if you only had a limited budget of sensors, let's say you want to drop buoys in the ocean, where would you put them to maximally measure some system? Well, something about the sparse structure of that system can inform sensor placement as well. Okay, so all of this is going to be related to uh, tools in linear algebra, optimization, and statistics. So, so everything we're going to talk about here is fundamentally rooted in linear algebra and optimization. And a lot of these robust algorithms you can think of in a statistical context. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. I'm super excited. This is one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, I think this is going to be a great lecture series. Uh, chapter three of our book, Data Driven Science and Engineering. And again, if you like this, uh, this video and this series, please like, please subscribe please comment below uh, and stay tuned because we're going to have a bunch. We're going to answer all of these questions. Thank you.